Well, good morning. Good to uh, be with you as uh, is our custom on Sunday mornings and be able to bring God's Word to you. The text is there before you in Luke chapter 3 and uh, echo some of the things that Pastor Mark shared. Uh, certainly, uh, happy Memorial Day weekend to you. We are uh, so grateful for the freedoms that we have. And we take these things for granted. I think we shouldn't, in light of the last year, year and a half, we shouldn't take these freedoms for granted. Um, but we, we, are, we are blessed. And I uh, was reminding the boys of that uh, this morning in the car on the way here, uh, that our brothers and sisters in certain parts of the world don't have the ability to gather like this and, and uh, proclaim God's Word and sing His praises openly. So uh, sometimes I think we need to count our blessings, and um, that wouldn't be possible, of course, if some folks hadn't been willing to sacrifice their lives so that we could do this. So we're certainly thankful uh, for that. I want to also echo uh, some of what Mark said earlier about the Friday night outreach event that we had with the school. Uh, I was stunned by the, the, uh, the turnout here. Uh, I did not... Faithless Kev, I guess. I don't know. I'm thinking... Well, we're having a drive-in movie, and we've got some folks uh, coming over, but, well, the weather's not cooperating, so what's that going to be like? And I'm thinking, well, it'll be good if a couple people show up, and it was more than a couple people. It was quite a, quite a few uh, folks that came. Uh, in fact, the fellowship hall, the way it was set up, it was actually quite crowded, and I, I would estimate, I'm not, you know, preacher counting or whatever, but I would say... Um, I think a good half or more were people that were from the school and whatnot. I don't know. I mean, there were a handful. There were our folks there, but there was a lot of folks from outside of Rikers Ridge. And so I'm certainly thankful for what the Lord is is doing here. We've got other things coming up this summer. And uh, so God's giving us platform and opportunity to minister to those around us and to do so in the name of Christ. And so we're so thankful that we have that opportunity. Well, it's our custom here at Rikers Ridge. If you're a guest today, of course, we're thankful that you're with us. Um, it's our custom at the beginning of the sermon to uh, take a minute and uh, spend that in silent prayer. Why do we do that? Well, we want to seek the Lord. Uh, if we're not, we're not seeking the Lord, uh, we got, we've got some problems. We've got issues. And so we want to seek the Lord together. And so we do that silently, and then I'll close us, and then we'll dive into the sermon time. So let's let's pray silently for one minute. Father, we thank You. As Mark prayed earlier, we thank You that we have the freedom to gather today. Thank You that You've made that possible through the sacrifices of uh, many people. And God, we thank You that You have spoken clearly in Your Word. Now give us ears to hear, we pray, that we might hear and that we might believe in an obeying way especially this morning as we listen and we consider what it is that Your Word says about repentance. Teach us, Lord. We need, to, we need to understand this. And so we pray that You would help us in this for Your glory. Pray for those who are with us or who may be listening online who don't know Christ and the hope that's found in Him. We pray that You would use Your Word to penetrate the heart and mind of that one. That You might transform this person 
for your glory alone. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Several years ago, my family and I were driving north on Interstate 35W in Fort Worth uh, when something really strange happened. Anybody ever been to Fort Worth before? I don't know, a couple, few people have. Um, we're driving north on the interstate, and I'm, I'm picturing it now even in my head, and all of a sudden traffic start, it comes to a stop. Uh, it's almost a standstill. Now, that was not abnormal. That kind of stuff happened fairly regularly. But it wasn't rush hour, so this was unusual that it would happen at this time of day. The cars began to slow down. Uh, I looked up, I'm driving, and uh, the cars start to part kind of like the Red Sea. And I'm thinking, what on earth is going on here? Is, is, uh, well, why would the cars part like a Red Sea? Well, let me add a little bit to the context, since most of you have never been to Fort Worth. If you're driving through the city, the interstate there almost forms like a big ditch or a canal in the, in the middle of the city. It's a cut section, as we would say in civil engineering. You're down in a kind of a pit, and the frontage roads are above you. You've got tall bar- or, uh, retaining walls on both sides, and you've got a barrier wall in the median, so you're pretty much enclosed there. The cars are parting. Why? Because someone is driving the wrong way on the side of the interstate that we're on. Not a good scenario. It's good that they had slowed down and everybody else had slowed down and they're parting the way. Of course, we're flabbergasted. If I would have thought better, I would have pulled my phone out. Or I don't know if I, we probably didn't even have smartphones at that time, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, it's an unbelievable situation. Now, when you're there in a place like that, that you can't just uh, pull over into the shoulder or into the median and do some kind of three-point turn or something, right? You're confined. There's no space for that. So the only hope in that situation was that somehow that car could clear a path to where they could make a U-turn. And that's exactly what they did. Thankfully, they they were able to get over to the next exit ramp and hopefully go see a doctor, I'm sure, heart condition or whatever that came on as a part of that. And they they did a U-turn and went up the exit ramp. And thankfully, everybody was okay. Uh, Could have turned out really badly. You've probably heard repentance described in terms of a U-turn before. I'm sure you've heard that. And it's for good reason, because the primary Greek words that are translated repent or repentance in our English Bibles indicate a change of direction uh, in the sense of a changed heart and a changed mind that results in changed actions. And so there is a change, a turn, if you will. Like a car turning around, a repentant person is made a conscious turn and is now heading in the opposite direction in a sense. Now, if the basic idea behind repentance is that simple, then why does it look like we don't really have a clue what it means in modern evangelicalism? After all, we've left the idea of repentance out of our gospel presentations or out of many of our gospel presentations for generations now. And even when we do acknowledge it, we cheapen it. As if repentance simply means that we give mental assent uh, in a general sense that we're sinners, right? Somehow we acknowledge that we're sinners. Do you acknowledge that you're a sinner? Yeah, I do. Well, then pray this prayer and you're in. That's kind of how we treat repentance. Or maybe we go a little bit deeper and we associate repentance with a confession of specific sins. Uh, Someone sins. They offer a tearful confession, all very emotional, of course, and that person is obviously repentant, right? Well, I'm not knocking uh, confessing our sin to the Lord and to others. That is biblical. And it is certainly a part of genuine repentance. However, it is not the whole of it, as we'll see in the passage this morning. So the question then before us is, what is repentance really? What is it? What does it look like? Well, we partially asked and answered that question uh, back at the end of last year, the last sermon actually of 2020, as we anticipated the new year. Some of you may recall that. Uh, we examined the life of King Manasseh from Second Chronicles 33. If you missed that sermon, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to it. But I, I would be naive if I thought that preaching one sermon on this topic... Um, during the holidays, in the midst of a global pandemic, 
is going to get everyone's attention and all of a sudden everyone in the church and everyone who's listening uh, has, has embraced, understood the biblical idea of repentance and now they're practicing a lifestyle of repentance as it's portrayed in Scripture. That would be naive to think that. Uh, I think sometimes as pastors we think, well, you know what? Here's the solution. I'll just preach a sermon on that. And one time, that's going to solve every problem. Wrong. Okay? I'm not that naive. I've been doing this long enough that I realize that's not true. So sometimes we need to come back around to things. So I want us to take a brief detour for a couple of weeks here uh, from our series in Genesis, and we're going to explore repentance again. And then next week, we're going to relate it to a specific situation that can but rarely does occur in local churches. And we'll get to that next week. Uh, For the meantime, though, I want us to examine the passage that's there before us in Luke 3. Because in this text, John the Baptist has much to teach us about repentance uh, and its fruits. And so we're going to look at four lessons this morning as we work through the text. Four lessons. Let's get to the first one this morning. The first lesson is this, repentance goes hand in hand with faith in Jesus Christ. Repentance goes hand in hand with faith in Jesus Christ. John the Baptist was a a forerunner of sorts. Many of you know that, I'm sure. The ultimate focus was never supposed to be on John the Baptist himself because his ministry was preparatory for the coming of Jesus Christ. God sent him for a specific purpose to prepare the way for the coming of Jesus Christ. And most of you know that, but as we're listening, if you're sitting there thinking, well, of course, we all know that, uh, don't, don't assume that everyone knows Scripture as well as you do, right? Let's be charitable, um, especially if folks are listening online. Maybe they're curious, they're t- tuning in. Let's be charitable and understand that everyone may not be aware of that. John the Baptist came kind of as a forerunner of Jesus, So let's look briefly at at the context of our passage, and it will show quite clearly that. Uh, The verses that precede this in Luke chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, demonstrate this preparatory function of John the Baptist's ministry. Uh, Luke 3, beginning in verse 3, it says, "...and he," that is John the Baptist, "...came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins." As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, here's the key, make ready the way of the Lord. Make His path straight. In other words, He's preparing the way for the the, the Lord, for Jesus to come. Every ravine will be filled and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight and the rough road smooth and all flesh will see the salvation of God. So there's that preparatory aspect. Then if we look at some verses that follow our passage later on in Luke chapter 3, picking up in verse 15, we read this. Now while the people were in a state of expectation, and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ, John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water. But one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in His hand to thoroughly clear His threshing floor and to gather the wheat into His barn, but He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Who's the one, the capital one that He's speaking there is of Jesus. And so again, John the Baptist is preparatory. Now what did his ministry focus on? Well, we read it earlier in the text. His ministry focused on repentance, which is why we're considering that today. And we're going to look more specifically at what repentance actually is in just a moment. But I want to look at a moment, at the moment, I want to zoom out a little bit and see how repentance fits into the bigger picture. John the Baptist's ministry focused on repentance, and that goes hand in hand with faith in Jesus Christ. He was preparatory for the coming of Christ. Some have spoken of repentance and faith uh, being two sides of the same coin. Don't have a coin in my pocket this morning. If you have one, you can pull it out and look at it. It, it, That's a good analogy because they do. They go hand in hand. The, the, The bottom line is John the Baptist's ministry was never supposed to be all there was. It wasn't like the focus was John and that's it. No, it was always intended to prepare the way for the ministry of Jesus. In the same way, repentance is not all there is. It is always supposed to be coupled with faith in Jesus. 
Those two go hand in hand. And that explains partially at least why Jesus said, and I often repeat from Mark chapter 1, what He did here. Mark chapter 1, now after John, John the Baptist had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the Gospel of God. Well, what did He say? And saying, the time is fulfilled and the Kingdom of God is at hand. And what does He say? Repent and believe the Gospel. They go together. At times I've heard something like this. Maybe you've heard this. Maybe you've even said this before. I'm going to clean up my life and then I'll come to Christ. I'm going to clean up my... I've got to clean up my life and then I'll come to Christ. My friends, is that even possible? Is that even possible? If repentance and faith go hand in hand, if repentance, like faith, is empowered by the Spirit of God working on and in a person then can someone genuinely exhibit repentance in a way that honors God if faith is left out of the equation? And the answer is no. They, they go hand in hand. They go together. Now, I realize that for some of our more philosophical folks, asking questions like that may lead to other questions. For instance, what about the Old Testament saints? You preached about Manasseh. Was his repentance genuine? Was, was that because it was before the earthly ministry of Jesus? The, the solution, of course, to that particular conundrum is that the Old Testament saints are also saved by Jesus. They look forward to the coming of Christ. And so, yes, his repentance was uh, genuine. Uh, we could talk about that another time. I don't want to go f- too far down a rabbit trail. But the point that I'm trying to make is that repentance and faith go hand in hand. They go together. If you're here this morning and you're still living for yourself, you're still living life on your own terms, rebelling against God, facing the wrath to come that John talks about, don't try to clean up your life or exercise repentance apart from faith in Jesus. They go together. Yes, turn from sin, but turn to Jesus because Jesus alone can save. He's, that's it. He, got that, he is the only way that God has made for man to be saved. And so, yes, turn from sin. We'll talk about repentance more in a minute. But place your faith in Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God who willingly gave His life for sinners to take their place and then rose from the grave and lives today to make sinful men, women, and children right with God again. My friends, there's hope in Jesus Christ alone. Alone. So if you're listening today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, my friends, I would love nothing more than to have the opportunity to speak with you personally about faith in Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith. Repent and believe the Gospel. It was true in their day. It's true in ours. And so if you're watching online, send us a message, a private message on the Facebook page, and I will personally get back with you. Or I'll be around after the service and I'd love to speak to you about that. I want to move on to our second lesson in the text this morning, and that's this. Repentance is necessary. Repentance is necessary. We looked at this back in December. I want to look at it one more time because it's so prominent in the text here. Why is repentance necessary? Look back at your passage there. Because what is coming? What is coming? What does John say in verse 7? What is coming? The wrath to come. So repentance is necessary. John he chides the people. I, I think he's questioning the genuineness of them coming out to him. He chides them. He calls them a brood of vipers. A, a more literal translation would be offspring or, or, or sons of, of, of vipers. It, it, one commentator said, he's, it's basically he's calling them children of the devil if you think about it in terms of Genesis 3. Saying, who warns you? You snakes, you get what what are you doing? He he sees the lack of genuineness there. But the point, ouch, by the way. Ouch. I mean, we think in scripture, you know, every it's the Bible. Everybody's, you know, they're just all kind and all the time, they never say anything abrasive or whatever. You sons of snakes! <laughs> That's basically what he's calling them. Well, let's ask another question, though. Why is wrath coming against sin? It's because God hates sin. He can't tolerate it. Right? We we, we tolerate it in ourselves like crazy. Oh, we just overlook our own sin. 
God's not okay with sin. He can't tolerate it. He's not okay with us claiming to be His children and in continuing as slaves to sin. He's not okay with that. He was never okay with that. Consider what John says in his first epistle. 1 John chapter 3. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. This is not John the Baptist, by the way. This is John the Apostle. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin, because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Now, I can already hear someone in their head objecting, objecting, well, does this mean that if I'm not perfect uh, in this life, that I'm not a Christian? That's not what he's saying. That's why the translators there are saying, who practices, right? It's a lifestyle, untransformed lifestyle. It's claiming something, but there's no repentance there. Right? There's no change. There's no transformation. Live exactly like the world. Nothing has ever happened. Nothing has ever changed in the least. And John's saying, well, it's obvious then that that one really doesn't love Christ. That one's not belonging to Him. So when we communicate the Gospel and we leave repentance out, are we actually communicating the Gospel at all? Can Jesus simply serve as an add-on to our existing lives? Like, you know, I, my life is great, and then I added Jesus, and it was so wonderful. It's almost like that lemon that you put on your water when you go out to eat, right? He, he, just, he just makes it a little bit better. That is not what the Bible speaks of. Dramatic change and transformation is what's being called for. Repentance. Is Christ supposed to be an add-on or is He supposed to be the focus of all of life? And that's not just preacher talk. That's for everyone in the pew too. I said that last week. It's not just, well, you pastors, of course you say that. Well, it, it, that's not for preachers. That's for all Christians. We're called to make Christ the focus of all of life. If repentance and faith go hand in hand, as I said earlier, and repentance is necessary because God hates sin and will pour out His wrath on sinners, then why in the world would we leave repentance out of the gospel that we preach? Is that appropriate? Of course not. When we do that, we empty the gospel of its transforming power. We essentially render these words from the Apostle Paul as meaningless. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, many of you know this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. If we leave repentance out and there's no change, no transformation, then this verse means nothing. It means nothing. Incidentally, I, I really think that part of the reason why evangelical Christians began to minimize or even eliminate repentance from gospel presentations is this. We, we're well-intentioned but we want to make it easier for people to come to Christ, right? We want to lower the bar, so to speak. Make it easier, more palatable. But don't worry, just, 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 just pray this prayer and, and man, you're, you're good to go. That's it. That's what we want to do. We don't want people to find the gospel offensive. But here's the deal. There is inherently offense in telling people that they need a drastic change of heart, mind, and lifestyle, and that because they've offended a holy God. That's, that's inherently offensive. There's no way around that. I don't know how that's not offensive to sinful people like us, right? That, that offend we need to change. Well, I, I don't want to change. That is inherently offensive. And if we fail to tell people that, if we fail to call them to repentance, are we really preaching the gospel at all? That's the point. 
Think about that as we move on to our third lesson from the passage, and this is where we're going to spend the majority of our time. Repentance bears ongoing specific fruits. Repentance bears ongoing specific fruits. I I think this is really one of the chief ways that we misunderstand repentance in our day. And so if you're zoning out, I want to encourage you, tune back in. Right? This is the time to really get your attention focused back. Look back with me at verse 8. Verse 8, Therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. John says that. What on earth does that mean? You know, sometimes I wonder if, nobody, if somebody's never been exposed to the, to the Bible, never been exposed to Christianity in some form, and we say these things, they sound like churchy words, we all understand them, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And you're, you're a child or something, and you're picturing a guy walking around with bananas or apples or something hanging off his arm. Is that what it means? Of course not. Okay, well then what does it actually mean? If it doesn't mean that, it must mean something. Well, it means this. It means that genuine repentance is accompanied by change. Genuine repentance is accompanied by change, much like what we looked at last week in the book of James with respect to faith. James said, faith without works is dead. The same is true of repentance. Repentance without fruit or change is dead. It's not real. That's what John is getting at here. That's why I mentioned that a tearful confession alone, hear me there, alone, does not constitute genuine repentance. Because genuine repentance is shown by what takes place after the tearful confession. Again, I'm not knocking confessions here. Those are important. But if sinful behavior continues unchecked, then the repentance simply isn't real. Right? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Now, I understand that sometimes on the road of repentance, we stumble. That does happen. But what is the trajectory? One of the things I always look for in pastoral situations is, is the person actually grappling with, at war with sin? Right? Maybe they stumble now and then, but they are actively fighting against it. That's a good sign. When they're okay with it, when they don't care at all, when they're quite comfortable and satisfied with their sinful habits, that's not good. Because it shows something's going on here that's not good. So repentance bears fruits, and those fruits are specific to the various life situations that we find ourselves in, and they correspond to the sins we've been committing. We see that in verses 10 to 14, the the three groups that John addresses, the crowds, the tax collectors, and the soldiers. And so he gives specific direction to those groups as far as what repentance looks like for them. So for the crowds, He tells them, share your food and clothing with the poor. For the tax collectors, he says, collect no more than you've actually been instructed to do. A word of explanation there. In that day and age, tax collectors were like contract employees. right? They would bid on the ability to be able to collect taxes for Rome. And so Rome said, you're going to collect this amount, and then they could mark it up whatever they wanted to mark it up. And if they, they chose to many times... Uh, they would mark it up substantially, which explains why they were hated so much. They were traitors for cooperating with the Romans in many people's minds, and they would take money from people unnecessarily. They would rob people, basically, under the, the name of pay your taxes. And so, no wonder they were often lumped together with sinners. How would you like that? If your occupation was, was lumped in there, uh, accountants and sinners, or electricians and sinners, tax collectors. That's why they were lumped together. They were a hated group. And yet he tells them, collect no more than you've been ordered to collect. To the soldiers, he says, don't abuse your power by taking money from people by force or bearing false witness against against them. And be content with your wages, which maybe wouldn't have been that great, but be content with them. Now, I want to pause for a moment and dig a little bit deeper here because I think it will help us understand repentance better if we ask this simple question. Why is it that John told each of these groups to act in these specific ways? 
right? Why did He specify that their fruit would look like that? Well, first of all, each group was prone to sin in those specific ways. And so he identified they probably were, in fact, sinning in those ways. Or else John wouldn't have prescribed the actions they did. And so for the crowds, apparently, they were neglecting the poor. And so that's a way that they're sinning. The tax collectors, as I said, are robbing people by marking things up too much. And the soldiers are taking advantage of their role to hurt other people. And they're discontent with their wages. And so John knows the right medicine for the right disease. Right? Somebody has cancer, you don't give them ibuprofen. Maybe you do, I don't know, as a part of the treatment. But that's certainly not the prime treatment. Right? He knows the right medicine for the right disease. Now, secondly, the actions that John prescribes involves the application of Scripture to life for each situation. That's what he's doing. It's not like John just randomly said, you know what, Um, uh, you guys do this over here and you guys do that. No, No, he has a basis for what he's telling them repentance looks like, and what it is is the application of Scripture to life. Now, bear in mind, in the time period that he's speaking to these Jewish folks that have come out, their Scriptures are our Old Testament. But let me demonstrate briefly how he's applying Scripture to life. So the crowds, they're, they're lacking in concern for the poor, which is a major theme throughout the Old Testament and certainly in the law. Let me give you a taste of what's said in the Law of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 15, Beginning in verse 7, If there is a poor man with you, one of your brothers, in any of the towns in your land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart, nor close your hand from your poor brother, but you shall freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need in whatever he lacks. Do you see that's directly applicable to what John is saying to the crowds? He's saying you're neglecting the poor? And so, don't do that anymore. Share with them. How about the tax collectors? John's prescription for the tax collectors is essentially a a specific application of a very well-known commandment from the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 20. You know this one. What does it say? Come on, we can read in unison, can't we? You shall not... Right. So he's telling the tax collectors, you're stealing. Don't do that anymore, right? This is the specific way in which you're stealing is you're over-collecting. Stop doing that. How about the soldiers? Well, taking money by force is stealing. We've already considered that. The false accusation part is addressed in the, the commandment that follows that. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And so he's applying that in a specific way. Don't accuse people falsely. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. He's applying Scripture to life. And of course, all of this, in most things, neighbor love is the foundation for this, right? Love for God and neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. You don't want anybody to steal from you or lie about you, so don't do that to other people. That's, of course, at the root of this. As far as the contentment goes, what if we look at Scripture not at a specific verse, but if we zoom out again, again, we need to have that skill to be able to look at Scripture, not just to say, I'm going to proof text everything, but I can also zoom out and see the big picture and see one of the major problems in Israel after they came out of Egypt was discontentment. Because what happens? They leave Egypt, and every time they encounter a problem, what do they do? They complain. They grumble. They fall on their face and they pray and they seek the Lord. No, they don't. We don't have any food. Who's this Moses guy? Let's kill him and go back to Egypt. Where's the water? Come on, Moses. What's the deal here? Oh, this miraculous bread that God happens to give us every day. I I don't like bread that much. I want meat. Remember the, 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 the fish and the melons and the cucumbers and all the stuff that we used to eat in Egypt? It was so great. Let's go back and fill our bellies. You were slaves! It's funny how nostalgia works, isn't it? Oh, back in the day, everything was wonderful. Oh, it was awesome. We had all this great food. Well, they had to feed you like that so you could do their work. 
And so the contentment can be an application even of that. Learn from the example of Israel. They were discontent. Don't be discontent. Now one other important thing that I want us to note, what John told each group to do involves sustained action over time, right? They're not checking boxes here. The change is to be ongoing. The proof's in the pudding. The repentance involves ongoing action. Ongoing action. He doesn't, it's not like he's desiring the tax collectors, for instance, to go back to their tax booth and say, the first person that comes up, I'm going to not rip off. But then every subsequent person, you just wait. I got, you got it coming for you, buddy. That's not genuine repentance. This is ongoing change. Ongoing action. Don't neglect the poor over a long period of time. Change your mind and your heart which will change your actions over a a sustained period of time. That's important for repentance. When repentance is genuine, when it's empowered by the Lord, it can break sinful habits. Remember this from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul, he, he was chiding the Corinthians over this, that, this, that, this, that, and everything because they needed it, honestly. And he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen, before we get haughty about anything in that list, I guarantee you if you dig your own, search your own heart long enough, something in that list probably applies to you. But listen, this is the point that I'm trying to make. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, at the very beginning, what does he say? He says, such are some of you. Is that what he says? I can read, by the way. Some of you wonder about that probably sometimes, don't you? Yeah, I can read. What does it say? Such, such were some of you. In other words, there's hope. Repentance, there there can be actual change. We live in kind of a hopeless society, right? We slap labels on people and we just think, well, there's never even a possibility for change. God can actually change people. He really can change people. Such were some of you. But not anymore. Change can happen. It can be specific and it can be sustained over time. Why? Because we're great people? No, because God is able. Focus isn't on us. It's on the Lord. So repentance bears specific ongoing fruits. My friends, have we understood repentance in this way? Have we understood it like this? Have we preached it like this? Have we practiced it in this way? Are there specific areas in our own lives now where the Lord is gently calling us to repentance? I often ask people this in specific situations uh, when we're speaking about sin. I ask them this, what, what does repentance look like in your situation? Right? What does it look like in your specific situation? Rather than, you know, I thought about this. And I thought, well, let me just kind of cast the net wide this morning and mention a couple things here and there. And I thought, you know what? That's really not that helpful. Maybe it would be better if we just examined a specific scenario, a particular problem that probably will touch some folks in here. But before you think, well, pastor's just talking about me or whatever, the part of the reason I picked this was because it's something that I've struggled with, okay? So lest you think I'm picking on you, I'm not. Maybe I am, but I'm, I'm not. Tragically, this is quite common. So let's consider a specific scenario and talk about what repentance might look like there. Your spouse and your children avoid you because you're like a dark storm cloud in your own household. You're miserable to be around. If there is any joy in your household, it's when you're absent from it. Everyone has to walk on eggshells around you because you'll either blow up verbally at them if they say the wrong thing, or perhaps you do the opposite and just ignore them when they would actually benefit quite, quite greatly from your attention. It's easy to, to find ourselves devoted to our hobbies or our work or this or that uh, when our families uh, are bothering us in some sense, right? It's easy to get, kind of get engaged in things. 
And maybe we justify our behavior in our own mind, right? It's their fault. They're, they're making me angry. Love that phrase. If my spouse and my kids would just be different, then I would love them well. But until they change, that dark storm cloud is what they're going to get. That's what they're in for. It's what they deserve. That's what we say in our minds. So what needs to happen here? Well, first of all, we need to establish that repentance is necessary. I think we can ask this very basic question. Is God okay with that type of behavior? Right? Is, is, God, is that God-honoring behavior? Is that behavior pleasing to the Lord? Is that how God treats us? I, I don't think so. In fact, I know that's not. Does our behavior towards others in our own household exhibit even the most basic biblical teachings, which Paul describes as the summation or the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament law? Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right? Is my behavior exhibiting neighbor love in my household? If I'm the dark storm cloud that no one wants to be around? Who, who, who wants to be treated that way? I don't think other people do want to. And what if Paul's instructions to believers in Ephesians 4? Ephesians 4, we read this, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And so even if it's true that our family has sinned against us in some way, is our response justified when we treat people like that? Is that how it's supposed to be? I think we all know the answer to that. So we identify that repentance is necessary because we recognize the behavior is not pleasing to the Lord and really the heart behind the behavior. Now our text today doesn't really deal with confession of sin, so I'll simply say this, a heartfelt confession of of sin to God and to those we've harmed is important because it, 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 it embodies a humble acknowledgement of what we've done. It is important, and we could take you to other places. When we sin against others, we sin against the Lord. If you're curious, look at Psalm 51, which David wrote after his sin with Bathsheba, and he was confronted on it. Confession is something that's important. It's just not highlighted in our text. But let me say this as a, as a qualification. I've said this earlier. Words alone are not sufficient. And in fact, your tearful, humble confession minus actual change can actually be harmful because it empties your words of their meaning. If you say these things and there's no actual change, it it, it makes you out to be a liar. And that's not good. It can actually harm relationships down the road. So words are not enough. Words alone are not enough. They're important, but they're not enough by themselves. So then we ask the question, what does repentance look like in this situation? Well, it somewhat depends on the specific ways that you've been mistreating those people around you. That's why in a biblical counseling situation, it's important to ask a lot of questions because we want to fully understand what's going on. So I would ask questions like, well, when does this mistreatment occur most often? Like, what's, tell me more about what actually happens. Uh, what, what are the desires at the root of the conflict? James chapter 4, key passage we don't have time to get into today. What's the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not your lusts or your desires that wage war in your members? We want something. We don't get it. Because we're not getting it, we're going to take it out of somebody else. That's what James is saying. So what's going on? What is it that we want so bad that we're willing to be that dark storm cloud? Well, let's move on. For the sake of time, let's look at a couple common scenarios here. Now, obviously, if you've been blowing up at your family, you need to stop doing that. I mean, I think that's pretty obvious, right? If you're, an, if you're the explosive type, you, hey, you got a hair trigger, boom, you got to stop doing that. But the biblical pattern of change is put off and put on. So we replace sinful habits with Christ-honoring ones. We don't just stop blowing up at people. In the verses we read from Ephesians a few moments ago, we don't just stop speaking harsh, harshly and having malice. We're kind. We're compassionate. We're tender-hearted towards others. We speak words that are edifying and encouraging to them. You back up a little bit in Ephesians 4, and Paul says this in Ephesians 4.29, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. That's the put-off part. 
but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Right? Stop blowing up the unwholesome, destructive speech and start speaking words that will build people up. I'm not saying lie to them or try to flatter them. Genuinely try to build people up. Or maybe you've handled things the opposite way. So instead of blowing up, you withdraw from everyone. Some of you know the old foreigner song, Cold as Ice. That could have been written about you. You're as cold as ice. I'm not going to sing it. Don't worry. (laughs) It's in my head at the moment, but I won't sing it. Well, certainly the proverbial ice needs to melt. Okay? Consider your actions in light of Colossians 3, verses 12 through 14. In Colossians 3, Paul writes this, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Many times when we we become cold as ice like that, we're acting that way because we have something against them. We're We're not forgiving others the way God forgives us. And maybe there's things that people have been doing to us that we need to overlook. After all, in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, Paul tells us that love is not provoked or easily angered. And so sometimes we just need to learn to let things go. People are different from us. Even if you had a clone of yourself in your household, I'm pretty sure that that person would get on your nerves sometimes. Okay? You you ever look back at your own actions and say, well, that was not bright? Imagine that clone doing those things. Or picture what people are dealing with with you because of your ice coldness. And don't just stop being cold, be warm. Be warm. That's good. Kindness, which incidentally is a fruit of the Spirit, as the kids said earlier, is huge when it comes to repairing broken relationships. There's obviously a lot more that we could say, and we've only explored one specific situation and the application of repentance in it, but this speaks greatly to the need for what many have called, and I would agree with, the personal ministry of the Word. Personal ministry of the Word. Or we could call it personal discipleship or biblical counseling, which is what I was trying to do in our example there. We're talking about the application of God's Word to specific life situations. And repentance is definitely a part of that. It is definitely a part of that. You know, it's easy to sit here Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and allow our sin to just fly under the radar. It just flies under the radar. right? Your specific sinful patterns or tendencies don't get mentioned from the pulpit because either the passage that we're preaching doesn't deal with that specific sin, or there's a limitation in time, and so we can't hit the application for everything, and so you kind of just fly under the radar there. And so you sit in the pew week after week, and I've been there, I understand this, most of my life I've been in the other position, not here. We sit in the pew week by week by week, flying under the radar, and we just kind of become almost self-satisfied. Well, so-and-so needed to hear that today. They needed to hear that. And every week we're thinking about someone else who needs to hear what was said, and we're not dealing with our own sin. We're not approaching the Lord with repentance. But if we will engage other believers at a deeper level, form genuine friendships with them, where we share not just an interest in the things of the world, and there's nothing wrong with that, of course, sports, cars, cooking, whatever, but we also share our spiritual lives with others, then we can begin to help one another in very specific ways. Now, I'm not calling people to be prideful sin inspectors, right? That's not what we're doing. But motivated by love, again, that's key. We speak the truth to one another to help one another become more and more conformed to the image of Christ. That's what God calls us to in the church. And that usually only happens when there's genuine relationships between 
people. And lest you think I'm speaking from just a theoretical basis here, I assure you I'm not because Melinda and I have benefited tremendously from loving, truthful engagement with other believers both inside and outside the church. Huge. I've told you before that a large part of my own experience with biblical counseling during my sabbatical uh, involved Pastor Tim asking me a lot of specific questions so he could help me understand where sin patterns had taken root in my own heart and life. That's a lot of what my sabbatical consisted of. Uh, he helped me consider what repentance looked like specifically in those areas. And so we dealt with things like the fear of man. Why is it that you can't say no to people? Because you're a man-fearer. Stop. Fear God. Serve Him. Or, how about this one? An ungrateful heart. I talked to you about that at Thanksgiving time. An ungrateful heart which causes us to always wish that things were different than they were. Instead of being thankful for the way that things are. Ungrateful heart. My friends, this past week, we had a a debrief meeting for our small groups uh, because we're taking a, a break for the summer with those groups. Now, some of the positive feedback on the small groups focused on how they help people learn uh, or get to know one another. They, they learn uh, and they make friends with other people. And what I've been talking about today, as far as repentance, flowers when people are in genuine relationship with one another. When people are genuinely friends and they take it to a deeper level spiritually. So let me urge you to consider joining a small group when our groups resume in August. They don't address everything that I've been talking about. right? We're not doing biblical counseling in the middle of the small group like you're on the hot seat today and we're going to examine your sin pattern. Um, I guess I would volunteer for that first if we were trying that, but that's not what we do. But they, they, they allow opportunities for us to cultivate relationships, which then can go to things like what we're talking about this morning. My friends, don't be content with shallow relationships in the church. Don't be content with that. Because when we do that, we miss so much. One last lesson, and we're going to close. This one's real brief. The last lesson, repentance can't be replaced by spiritual heritage or religious trappings. Repentance can't be replaced by spiritual heritage or religious trappings. That's there back in verse 8. John attacked the notion that the audience could come and instead of pursuing genuine repentance, could rely on the fact that they're sons of Abraham or they're Abraham. We have Abraham for our father. We've been in the series on Abraham. We know the covenant promises that were made to him. And so he's saying, don't rest in that. Don't rest in that. Don't rest in the fact that Abraham is your physical descendant. What you need is an interchange of heart that works its way out through changed behaviors, repentance. My friends, that's not just a problem in the first century. It's a problem in the 21st century too. So maybe you're here today or you're listening and you're resting in the faith of your parents or the faith of your grandparents. Of course God will accept me. I'm a crouch. My my, my dad is the pastor. Of course God will accept me. Of course. No, do not say you have Kevin as your father. Boys, I'm sorry to pick on you. Uh, I I could insert several other names, last names, which I'll refrain from doing, that are represented by multiple generations in this specific local church and say the exact same thing. Don't rest in the faith of your parents or your grandparents. Look to Christ. Repent and believe the gospel yourself. Or maybe it's the religious trappings that are a stumbling block. Well, I'm regular in my attendance, in my service, in my giving good, but why do you do those things? Are they the outworking of an inner change that takes place? Genuine repentance that works its way out because it doesn't work in the reverse. Outward activity minus heart change equals... He's calling the people to repentance which bears specific ongoing fruit and ultimately faith in Jesus Christ who empowers the whole thing. 
And the call today is the same. God is calling us as his people to live lives of repentance and faith. Yes, we exercise repentance and faith when we come to Christ initially, but we are traveling the road of repentance and faith as believers in Christ. And so maybe today, there's an area you're, you're wrestling with. Maybe it's the, the specific situation that I talked about with your treatment of your family, or maybe it's something else, but you recognize the application that if you will dig deep enough, there's a real issue there. The Scriptures say that the kindness of the Lord leads us to repentance. God is kind. You're listening today in part because God is kind. And He's allowed you to hear from His Word and He is gently calling you to a life of repentance and faith. He's calling us to that. Would you look to Christ today? Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank You that Your mercies are great. Grace greater than all our sin. Oh, what a glorious concept. What a glorious truth. You've demonstrated Your love for us in the giving of Your Son. But You've also demonstrated Your love for us in the giving of Your Spirit. And so, Lord, we pray that You would empower us by Your Spirit today to confront sin in our lives head on. And by Your kindness, by Your Spirit, to pursue the course of repentance. And to rest in Jesus Christ and His finished work for our salvation. Lord, thank You so much for what Jesus did for us that we could never do for ourselves. Would You transform us more and more into His likeness? And would You use this church, Lord, we pray, to reach others with the life-changing truth of Jesus Christ. We pray it in His name. Amen.